On May 11, 2011, a team of six climbers from Mountain Trip began their ultimate journey to the summit of Denali via the West Buttress Route. The team consisted of Tony Diskin, Jeremiah O'Sullivan, Beat Niederer, and Lawrence Cutler, along with their experienced guides Dave Staheli and Henry Munter. Staheli, 57, began his career with the renowned Ray Genet of Genet Expeditions in the 1980s, when commercial climbing operations on McKinley began to gain popularity. The Mountain Trip website describes Staheli as a fearless leader and veteran in Denali. He was considered the most experienced Denali guide working on the mountain at the time, his first guided trip dating back to 1982. Known as an Alaskan legend, Staheli played an important role as one of the senior guides and mentors at the company, Mountain Trip. According to the report, the team rested at High Camp May 9 and 10, the morning of May 11, 2011 dawned clear, and the winds were calm. Although the temperatures were icy, the team had a chance to reach the summit before the predicted high winds arrived. This was crucial because strong winds along McKinley's summit ridge are common and dangerous. If the team did not seize the opportunity on May 11th, they would likely be stuck in camp the next day, and there was no guarantee when another opportunity would present itself. On May 11th, the team departed from the high camp located at an elevation of 17,200 feet on Denali. The MT2 guides purposely waited to depart high camp until late morning when the sun would be shining on the first part of the ascent, making it easier to stay warm. It took the team three hours to climb to Denali Pass, only 1,000 feet above high camp. Tony Diskin decided to turn around during the climb. Diskin was wearing gloves instead of mittens, causing frostbite on his hands. He and assistant guide Henry Munter descended to the 17,200 feet camp and then continued descending to the 14,200 feet camp. Jeremiah O'Sullivan, Lawrence Cutler, and Beat Niederer continued their climb, accompanied by guide Dave Staheli. This reduced the original team of six climbers to four people. In the late afternoon, they successfully reached the summit of Denali. Around 8 p.m., they were passed by another team from the Alaska Mountaineering School on a relatively flat section of the climb, the football field at about 19,500 feet elevation. By then, the group led by Staheli had been climbing for more than eight hours. This team reached the summit first and stayed there for only a few minutes because of strong winds. Staheli and his three clients passed them at about 300 feet below the summit and reached the top just before 10.45 p.m. There they took photos for about 10 minutes before beginning their descent. But during their descent, things went horribly wrong. At dusk of night, Staheli and his three clients began their descent. There was very little light, just enough to see without a flashlight, but not enough to see their surroundings. As the group returned and began their descent around Pig Hill at 19,500 feet, the short steep slope between the football field and the top of McKinley, the winds increased, exacerbating the problems of fatigue and cold. It was at this point that disaster struck. During the descent, Jeremiah O'Sullivan tripped and fell. One of his crampons got stuck on a patch of paved snow. The snow was slippery and unforgiving and O'Sullivan's fall set off a chain reaction, causing the entire team to slide at least 300 feet down the icy glacier. As a result of the fall, O'Sullivan suffered a broken leg. In addition, guide Dave Staheli broke a rib and beat Niederer dislocated a shoulder, possibly sustaining other injuries. Lawrence Cutler had strained his back. According to the report, the climbers made a decision not to use snow pickets, which are aluminum stakes used to anchor ropes during the descent of Pig Hill. This decision, while not uncommon, resulted in the four climbers being roped together without a secure belay. When Mr. O'Sullivan tripped, he inadvertently pulled the other climbers off their feet as well. A fall while descending on snow with a team roped together and using no fixed protection such as a snow picket or ice screw when climbers are fatigued is the most common cause of an accident on Mount McKinley, the latest investigation says. A running belay could have prevented the injuries in this fall. In addition, the team was in disarray and the weather was deteriorating. The report was also suggesting that Staheli may have hit his head. Staheli could have been dazed by the fall and unable to make decisive, critical decisions in the aftermath of the accident. Radio communication for help was not possible for the group. In an effort to climb quickly, the group had left a second satellite phone in their high camp at 17,200 feet. The only phone Mr. Staheli carried to the summit was damaged when he tried to attach its antenna after the fall. The other phones the group carried also did not function or could not connect to anyone at the upper camp. 
The report states that Mr. Stahili's assistant, who had returned to camp earlier because another client was frozen, did not have a family radio service line of sight phone that could have received the call. But even if they had been able to reach someone, the report found that weather conditions at the time were too bad to initiate a rescue. He was having trouble handling the group's satellite phone and accidentally broke its antenna while trying to connect it. According to Cutler, Stahili then requested him and Niederer go to Archdeacon's Tower and try to reach the high camp using a handheld radio. Stahili later told investigators that he was taken aback when he saw the two climbers descending without him. He did not remember asking Cutler to make a radio call, nor had he tried to contact him to make sure the group stayed together. Instead, he put O'Sullivan in a bivouac bag and began to pull him to the edge of the soccer field about 300 feet away. According to the report, as he was moving him, the bivouac sack was blown away. He then used O'Sullivan's pack to insulate him from the snow, as he did not bring an insulite pad with him. The contract signed with McKinley concessionaries mandate their guides to carry insulite pads in case of such accidents. It remains unclear why Stahili did not have one with him. With no insulite pad to lay O'Sullivan on, and no shovel or snow saw to make a shelter to protect him from the wind, Stahili decided to wrap his own heavy parka around O'Sullivan for extra insulation, but the parka unfortunately blew away during the night. After giving away his parka to O'Sullivan for extra insulation, Stahili exposed himself to a high risk of hypothermia. This forced him to quickly descend to high camp to avoid hypothermia. According to the report, Stahili said he left O'Sullivan because there was nothing else he could do for him and his only option was to get down to high camp and get help. At approximately midnight, Stahili caught up with Cutler and Niederer on the northwest side of Archdeacon's Tower Ridge. Cutler said that Stahili told him and Niederer that they would all descend to Denali Pass, where Stahili would try to find them a place to stay while he descended the Autobahn to high camp to get help. Cutler also said Stahili told the two of them that they could die if they descended from Denali Pass down the Autobahn on their own. Stahili told investigators that he could not recall a dire warning about Denali Pass, but admitted that whatever he said was probably prefaced by, the Autobahn is a fairly hazardous place. The three men began descending to the pass without being connected by ropes. Stahili, trying to stay warm, went at lightning speed and quickly left the customers behind. Cutler, trying to keep sight of Stahili in front of him and Niederer behind him, eventually lost sight of them. Stahili waited for Cutler to catch up with him at Zebra Rocks at 18,600 feet. Accounts of what occurred next differ among those involved. About 1 a.m., the strong winds expected came up. The winds were powerful, estimated to be between 70 and 80 miles per hour. Cutler and Stahili waited about 10 minutes for Niederer at Zebra Rocks. It was freezing cold and they were battered by tremendous winds. Niederer was nowhere to be seen. Finally, they concluded that they could wait no longer. According to the report, Stahili told Cutler that they would descend on the Harper Glacier side of the ridge to avoid a steep icy section that they had come up during the ascent. Stahili continued down, but Cutler had either not heard or understood the instructions and lost sight of Stahili. The situation had reached a critical point, using the words basically every man for himself and doubted I would survive. It seems that Stahili had not passed on the warning to his clients. Indeed, Cutler did not mention anything about this, and besides, Stahili had not seen Niederer since they parted ways almost an hour ago. Cutler informed investigators that he left quickly after his conversation with Stahili. According to him, the last time he saw the guide was near Denali Pass at 18,200 feet while descending. The report states that he did not encounter Stahili again at the camp until hours later. Stahili arrived at the camp around 3.30 a.m. and attempted to organize a rescue operation. However, the assistant guide, John McGee, who was at the camp, did not have access to a radio. Therefore, he had to go to the Alaska Mountaineering School camp to borrow a satellite phone. He contacted Bielmeyer, the mountain trip manager. According to records, the park service was notified of the emergency 15 minutes later after one of the company's climbing teams ran into trouble high on the mountain. Cutler was on Denali Pass above the high camp considering his next move. He had received a warning about the dangers of descending from Denali Pass. However, due to the strong and stormy winds, he could not find a suitable place to take shelter. After waiting about 30 minutes for Niederer, he decided to descend the Autobahn to stay warm according to the report. The descent was unpleasant and frightening. The route was marked by pickets left over from the 2010 climbing season that indicated a dangerous path with numerous crevasses. 
During the storm, Cutler failed to notice the new pickets placed above the glaciers and began following the old path until he arrived at a huge hole in the ice. The report stated, Cutler had to climb up the slope several times to avoid crevasses and to get back on the correct route. He was constantly scared that he might fall. The wind became so strong as he descended the Autobahn that he had to go into a self-arrest position multiple times to keep from being blown off the slope. Blowing snow made it difficult to see. Cutler continued to descend the Autobahn and was about a third of the way down. At 4.30 a.m., other climbers spotted him from the high camp. As the storm intensified, John McGee and a guide from the Alaska Mountaineering School went out to help Cutler. After Cutler had returned, the winds continued to increase at high camp, destroying the snow walls around the tents and damaging the tents. The winds became so strong that McGee said he worried about his own survival in camp. The violent storm forced everyone to stay in place and there was no possibility of rescue from the ground. Assistance was requested from the Alaska Air National Guard, which sent a C-130 Hercules search plane from Joint Base Elmendorf-Richardson near Anchorage. The men aboard the helicopter flew to O'Sullivan's position, searching the mountain slopes. Then came the call. Hey, we got a guy up here, and he's waving at us. Leonard was overjoyed. Holy mackerel, they're still alive up here, he exclaimed. O'Sullivan, above 17,200 feet, was lucky as the wind began to die down. By 5 p.m., a helicopter managed to fly over him, but failed to land. The helicopter returned to the 14,200 camp to discuss with Ranger Erickson whether they could use short haul to rescue O'Sullivan, since there were no other viable options. After the wind died down, a helicopter pilot named Andy Hermansky flew up the mountain in an A-Star B-3 helicopter rented by the Park Service. Together with a ranger, they flew to where O'Sullivan was, and confirmed he was still alive. Hermansky then flew back to the high camp to drop off the ranger. At approximately 7 p.m., the helicopter returned to the football field with a Coast Guard rescue basket attached to the end of the short haul line, the report says. O'Sullivan had crawled approximately 500 to 800 feet to the southwest of the normal trail to the summit seeking shelter from the wind. Despite the extreme weather conditions with winds in excess of 70 miles per hour, and wind chill temperatures well below freezing and having been on the snow for more than 17 hours, Mr. O'Sullivan miraculously managed to sit upright and signal to searchers in the helicopter the next evening. Pilot Andy Hermansky was determined to reach the stranded climber. With a ranger at his side, they flew to O'Sullivan and confirmed he was alive. But their mission was far from over. The rescue time was extremely short. The helicopter could not stay on the mountain for long and had a weight limit it could not carry a large number of rescuers. Hermansky had to make a difficult decision. He initially planned on roping down a rescuer who would bring O'Sullivan to the helicopter, but there was a problem. He could only pull one person off the mountain, the climber or the rescuer. Suddenly, the pilot had an ingenious idea. Instead of letting a rescuer down, he let down a basket for O'Sullivan. The helicopter moved towards O'Sullivan, dangling a basket next to him. Hermansky brought the basket close to O'Sullivan and hovered above him so the man could climb into it. The pilot flew him to base camp in a daring short-haul rescue, the highest ever on McKinley. O'Sullivan was transferred to a waiting life med flight to Anchorage. O'Sullivan later stated in an interview that he did not remember seeing the basket approach, but that it was an unforgettable moment for him. I don't know exactly how I got into it, he said then. There was a strap. I remember looking at something, thinking about hooking in. According to the report, he was flown down to base camp at 7,200 feet hanging below the helicopter sitting in the basket. O'Sullivan was then flown to a hospital in Anchorage, where he was treated for several weeks by top experts in cold weather injuries. But unfortunately, despite their efforts, O'Sullivan's hands could not be saved. O'Sullivan's frostbite required that all his fingers and thumbs on both hands and part of one foot had to be amputated. I could still be laying up there in the snow, O'Sullivan said. I'm lucky. I'm looking forward to meeting that helicopter pilot. It was so good to see him. O'Sullivan would not comment on the events that led to his rescue, but he did acknowledge that mountain trip guide Dave Stahili played a crucial role in saving his life. When he broke his leg after a rope team of four climbers led by Stahili fell, Stahili provided first aid, dragged O'Sullivan to a flatter area below the ridge, and then sought help from two other clients. Later that day, Mr. Niederer's lifeless body was identified on the Harper Glacier as a small red-orange stain in his parka against the vast white snowfield.
According to the autopsy report, the 38-year-old man's cause of death was caused by hypothermia due to exposure to the environment. Niederer was found with his backpack on and his ice axe. While rescue efforts were underway, Ranger Wright received instructions to recover Niederer's body. At the same time, Park Service officials began an extensive investigation into the causes of this tragedy. The investigation revealed several factors that contributed to this unfortunate incident. Based on the facts, the Evaluation Committee determined several factors contributed to this terrible event. These included lack of adequate equipment, failure to work together as a group, unfavorable weather conditions, a relatively slow ascent of the McKinley, and poor communication. The helicopter flew Staheli and Cutler down the mountain the next day. In the aftermath of the tragedy in Denali, a report was released with recommendations to prevent similar accidents from happening in the future. One of the key recommendations was for guided teams to carry more cold weather gear. The report concluded that leaving behind the crucial gear that could have kept the men warm and sheltered was a critical mistake with little payoff. Moreover, the report was critical of the guide, Staheli. It stated that his decision-making was flawed. The investigators found that he was ill-prepared for the consequences of the accident. When the team shattered, he was no longer able to take responsibility for the safety of its customers. This accident also led to a lawsuit against the company Mountain Trip, which employed Staheli. According to a wrongful death lawsuit filed by Niederer's family in federal court in Anchorage, Mountain Trip allegedly failed to provide adequate safety measures and equipment for the expedition. According to the suit, the company did not have enough guides, radios, ropes, harnesses, or GPS equipment for the climbers. The company also allegedly failed to coordinate with the National Park Service or other rescue services to locate and remove Niederer from the crevasse. Mountain Trip was charged with negligence, breach of contract, and fraud. In the suit, the family demanded unspecified damages for Niederer's pain and suffering, medical expenses, funeral expenses, and loss of income and companionship. Mountain Trip denied any wrongdoing and filed a motion to dismiss the lawsuit. The company stated that Niederer had signed a waiver of liability before embarking on the expedition. In addition, the company argued that Niederer's death was caused by his negligence and by the inherent risks of mountaineering. Beat Niederer was an experienced climber who had climbed mountains around the world. In addition, he was a loving husband and father of two young children. Thanks for watching this story. Don't forget to like and subscribe and turn on your notification bell to stay updated on more similar videos. We would love to hear your thoughts, so feel free to share your comments below. Until next time.